Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love to us today. Thank you for that children's story about the fence and about Homer. Strengthen us to remain inside the fence day by day, knowing that it's the place of peace, it's the place of joy, it's the place of happiness. Please send the Holy Spirit to strengthen us to ever walk within the fence. And guide us with wisdom as we open your word just now and please rivet our brains, our minds to accept nothing but that which we can see in your word. Bless us to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in the seven last plagues today. We've gone through Revelation chapters 1 through 15. Let's just do a brief review, and I'm going to try to keep this brief because I've got about 25 slides, and if we get our review going too much past the brief part, um, we can be here quite a while. So... Let's do it real brief. You want those lights out? Does that work better? Make it brighter on the screen? It's. Try that. You guys can still see out there? See your Bibles? Okay. You can't see. Oh, okay. Let's take a quick look at Revelation 14 verses 7 through 7 through 10. Let's just look there real briefly today. We went over this in detail. We had about five, maybe more messages on the three angels' messages, but let's just briefly review it. Um, What does it mean to fear God? What did it mean to fear God? Keep His commandments. Keep His commandments, okay. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 12, 13, and 14 said that. Okay, Psalm 112, verse 1 said that. What was another meaning for it? What was it, sweetie? To reverence God, okay. Okay, to show reverence for God. All right. How about to give glory to Him? What was that, David? Okay, okay. Um, How did we find the phrase give glory to God in other parts of Scripture and what did it mean in those other contexts? Louise? It means to glorify Him in your body. And it's referring to how health message is found, I think, in Corinthians. Very good, Louise. Okay, let somebody help. Oh, okay. I'll have to repeat what's being said. Louise said that to give glory to God is in reference to our health message. uh, To glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. And Louise said that's found in Corinthians. Very good. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Does anybody remember the other verse that talked about giving glory to God in reference to our body and our spirit. Does anybody remember the other verse? Chapter 6, verse 19 Very good. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That's right, Louise. Very good. So the concept in Revelation 14 to give glory to Him, it connects the health message with the last message of warning to the world. And health, in connection to the gospel... The purpose of the health message is not to earn brownie points with heaven. It's to get our minds clear enough so that we can hear God's voice. And we can't do that if we're eating garbage, if we're sleeping at all hours of the night, if we're not exercising, and if we're not drinking water, but rather drinking all other kinds of stuff. 
we can't have a clear mind to hear God's voice if we're not following health principles. We can't. It's impossible. It's impossible. Sure. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And the other one is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. And in that one it says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, a definite connection. The health message is a part of the last messages of mercy to the world. Because deception will be so rampant. We've got to have a clear mind, folks, to be able to, to discern right from wrong. So we stand on God's side. All right, the hour of his judgment has come. When did that judgment begin? 1844. Okay, tell me some other word that means the same thing as judgment in the Bible. What's another word that means the same thing? Not probation. David, what'd you say? Trumpets? No, that's a good try. I like what you guys are doing. You're, you're not hesitating. Even if you got a right answer or wrong, that's okay. That's how we learn. Come on. Now. Okay, you've got judgment. There were two other words that mean the exact same thing in Scripture that are synonymous with judgment. What, was, what also happened on the day of judgment in the ancient Israel? Atonement. Atonement. That's right. The day of atonement and the day of judgment were the same thing. What happened on that day? Come on. The temple was cleansed. Good, David. You see, folk, the only way we're going to understand the connection between Revelation 14.7 and Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, the only way we arrive at that is by understanding that judgment, atonement, and cleansing of the sanctuary are synonymous terms. They're synonymous, mean the same thing. Okay, how about what is worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters? One word, what is that talking about? Creation and the Sabbath. Okay, what is true worship? Okay, good Nelly. To follow God's commandments and not to follow man-made traditions. Very good. Okay, now here's, here's the toughest question. If you had to summarize in one statement what the first angel's message is all about, one simple statement, what, is, what are those messages all about? Okay. You'd say worship. Okay. Hi, Dennis, what did you say? You said worship. Okay. Making a choice. Okay. The gospel to honor our high priest. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, good, Eddie. Very good. I'm not, I'm not going to say. Because it's not fair. It's not fair as a teacher because as a teacher you're looking for a specific answer and when every other answer comes in you say, well, that's pretty good, but, but that's really not fair. All of your answers were good. They were all good. All right, Revelation 14, 8. Babylon is fallen, is fallen at great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Who's Babylon? Okay, we have the papacy and we have apostate Protestant churches. The Babylon that fell in the context of the judgment in and around 1844 represented who? Apostate Protestantism. Yeah, because the Babylon of Revelation 17, which is the papacy, 
They didn't fall in 1844. They've been fallen for centuries. Okay? So the Babylon of Revelation 14.8 represents the apostate Protestant churches that rejected the first angel's message. All right, what is wine? What did the wine represent that Babylon's giving the world to drink? What is that? False doctrine. False doctrine. So if, if, if we are listening, let's just take a little example. If, if we're drinking once a week, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen, Dennis? We're going to get our mind contaminated, aren't we? Our resistance will be lowered. What happens when somebody drinks? What do we say when they get intoxicated? We say they are what? They're drunk. They're drunk. So if we, if we are listening to false doctrine week in and week out, you know what eventually happens? We get drunk. We become stupefied. We can't think anymore. We can't think anymore. Okay, okay, Barbara. Good point. We are thinking something. It's just not right. It's just not right. All right. Third angel's message. Angela. I think it goes back to by beholding, we become changed. So if we're going week after week and we're beholding unto righteousness, we're changing our mind. Yeah. We're changing our mind. Absolutely, Angela. Absolutely. Chuck. Absolutely, Chuck. Spiritual alcoholics, don't we? Absolutely, Chuck. That's a great point, both of you guys. Excellent points. All right, the third angel's message. If any man honor the tradition, the, the man-made tradition of the beast, and who's the beast to Revelation 14.9? Nellie, say it louder. The papacy. Absolutely. This is the first beast of Revelation 13. Claims to be God, claims power to forgive sins. His image, who is the image? Apostate Protestantism, that's right. And what is the mark of the beast? What's the mark? Sunday, Sunday keeping, that's right. Okay, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. All right, that's in a nutshell. We're not going to be able to do any more right now because uh, I want to get to the study for today, the seven last plagues. And I've subtitled it, Heaven's Strange Act. Because when God finally shuts the door and says, I can't do anything else to help people, now I'm going to have to judge what they have done. It's a strange act because God has tried so long to help. Okay, first plague. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways. Pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So now these concepts connect right back to the third angel's message. Those who receive the mark of the beast, those who worship the image of the beast, will receive the first plague. They will be hit by the first plague. And the mark of the beast again is what? Sunday or self-worship. Yeah. Sunday worship. And upon them which worshipped or honored this Sunday tradition of apostate Protestantism, they will receive the first plague plague. Is it important which day we go to church on? You bet it is. Is it important who is the Lord of our lives? Absolutely it is. All right, next slide, sweetie. The papacy's mark of authority. We've read these quotes several times. I'll just read one of them. Uh, we'll read this one right here from Priest Brady. In his address reported in the Elizabeth, New Jersey News, March 18, 1903, 
It says, It is well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. That's the papacy's mark of authority, and by honoring it, all these other churches go right along with Rome. Next slide. This is an important life or death issue. You know, a man called me this week from Tennessee, and he said, you know, a lot of people don't think the three angels' messages are, are significant anymore. Well, folk, by how we respond to them determines our destiny. Either eternal life or eternal death. They're important. Dreadfully, very important. The first plague falls on those who continue in rebellion by keeping Sunday. You see, folk, I put in there, in rebellion by keeping Sunday, because sometimes the Seventh-day Adventists, we think, well, you know, as long as I go to church on Saturday or on the Sabbath, I'm okay. Well, wait a minute. I can't live in rebellion for six days and then go into church on the seventh and say everything's all right. Because you know what that is? That, that makes the Sabbath a confessional. I live in Babylon for six days. I live in rebellion against God and against His commands. And then on the seventh day, I go confess and now everything's all right. Uh-uh. The Sabbath is not our confessional, folks. The Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to God through the week. That's what it is. That's why many people in Seventh-day Adventism who keep the Sabbath but are in rebellion against God throughout the other six days of the week, when Sunday laws come, what will they do? They will embrace Sunday. And that is why many people who are loyal to God and are in submission to Him throughout the week, but still go to church on Sunday, when the loud cry comes, they will turn away from Sunday and they will keep the Sabbath. That's why. Divine retribution falls on those who are rebelling against God. So many feel that a day is not important. How many times we've heard that? The first plague says otherwise. Rebellion against heaven is treated with great concern, great entreaty, and if rejected, great retribution. Mark it well. But wait just a minute. Wait just a minute here. Next slide. Paul says, now folk, in Romans 14, 5 and 6, Paul makes a comment that a lot of people in other churches, throw in Seventh-day Adventist faces. You've heard that one, haven't you, Dennis? Sure, sure you have. Now, folk, we need to understand what this verse is talking about. Because if we don't, and somebody throws this in our face, we say, oh, well, maybe you're right. Well, folk, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. So all Bible verses, when rightly understood, are in absolute harmony. Let's read the verse. Romans 14, 5 and 6. Watch. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now isn't Paul saying here, you can choose whatever day you want to worship on. What is he talking about then? Okay, he's talking about the ceremonial Sabbath feast days. He says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. Paul says we need to let everyone worship when they want. Question mark. Let's go on. Stop judging. We've heard this too. Watch what Paul says here, folk. We've got to understand this. In Colossians 2, 14 to 17, Paul said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that, were against, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, let no man judge you in meat. How many times have we judged people because they eat flesh? Come on. How many times have we... You shouldn't be eating that. You should be a vegetarian. What did Paul just say here, folks? He said, because Jesus went to the cross and nailed the ordinances to the cross, we shouldn't be judging people on their flesh food. Isn't that right? No, it isn't. What is Paul talking about here? We need to know that. Or in drink. If I want to have a little wine, what's wrong with that? Get off my case. Didn't Paul say that? Don't let anyone judge you in your drink? We'll figure it out here. Or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the what? And what did Paul say? He said, don't let anybody judge you on your Sabbath days. So if I want to keep Sunday as my Sabbath day, who do you think you are to judge me? Come on, we've all heard that, haven't we? We need to be able to answer this. Okay, I've underlined these five things for a reason. Meat, drink, holy day, new moon, Sabbath days. You remember those five things. Paul said, these are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. When will we stop judging? Now, what is Paul talking about in Romans 14, 5 and 6? And what is Paul talking about here in Colossians 2? What was Paul's trouble in the first century? Was it over Sabbath and Sunday? Or was it with Jews who still wanted to keep the ceremonial aspects of the law? That's what it was over. Next slide, sweetie. Watch this. There were five things in Colossians 2 that Paul brought up. What was Paul talking about? This is found in Numbers chapter 28, 11 to 17. It's in the book of Numbers chapters 28 and 29. If you want to go back and read both chapters, watch this. It says, Moses said, in the beginnings of your months. Well, how did they know when their month began? It was from a new moon. Was that one of the things Paul mentioned in Colossians 2? Yes, it was. There's the first thing, new moons. Paul said, or Moses said, ye shall offer a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot, and three-tenth deals of flour for a what? A meat offering. Now that's one of those five things Paul mentioned in Colossians too, didn't he? Paul was not saying don't judge or don't talk to people about what they should be eating. He was talking about something that was offered on one of those ceremonial Sabbath feasts of the Jews. All right, so there's your meat offering. He goes on down, Moses does. He says, for a burnt offering of a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire to the Lord, and their drink offering shall be half a hin of wine. Do you remember that in Colossians 2? There it is. There's our drink there's our meat. There's our new moons. You remember there's two left. Holy days and Sabbath days. Let's see if Moses talked about those. He goes on. We'll skip a little bit. It says, And in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. In the first day shall be a holy convocation. There's a holy day right there. Did Paul talk about that in Colossians 2? He sure did. And what do they do on this holy day? It says, Ye shall do no manner of servile work therein. You cease from work. Now what day is that when people cease from work? That's a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath. So folk, right here in the feasts of the Jews, from Numbers 28 and 29, Leviticus 23 talks about it as well, you have the five things that Paul mentioned in Colossians chapter 2. 
You have the new moons, the meat offerings, the drink, the holy days, and the Sabbath days. Paul was talking about the ceremonial Sabbath feasts of the Jews. And Paul said all of those were shadows of things to come. They all pointed forward to Christ. That's what Paul said. All five pieces that Paul was talking about were found in the feast days. Paul said they were no longer binding. They pointed forward to Christ and some work he would do on behalf of man. Every one of the feast folk pointed forward to something Jesus was going to do. That's what Paul was talking about. Next slide, sweetie. Feast day Sabbaths. Paul had to deal with Jews who were continually pushing the merits of keeping the Jewish ceremonies and ordinances. Notice this in Acts 15, 1 and 2. It says, Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Was circumcision one of the ceremonies or ordinances of the Jews? See, the Jews were pushing those things throughout the Mediterranean world. And they said, if you don't follow the ceremonies of the Jews, you're not saved. So they were making these issues of salvation. And Paul came along and said, because Christ took these out of the way and nailed them to his cross, he said, let no man therefore judge you in regard to these feast days. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Paul told them that the ceremonies all pointed forward to Christ and that since Christ came, they should no longer be observed. Paul's comments had nothing to do with the seventh-day Sabbath, but everything to do with the ceremonial Sabbath feast days. Do you know what, folks? On what days could the ceremonial Sabbath feast days fall? Does anybody know? On what day of the week did these fall? What, Jim? Any day, Any day of the week. Any day, because it was all dependent upon the moon, the new moons. Do you know what it was called when a ceremonial Sabbath feast day fell on the seventh day of the week? A high Sabbath. That's right, a high Sabbath. Now, do you know the reason why the Jews wanted to take Christ's body down from the cross on that Friday when he died? Do you know why? Because Sabbath was about to come, and that Sabbath was a very special Seventh-day Sabbath because it fell on the ceremonial Sabbath of unleavened bread. The Bible in John 19 calls it a high day. A high day. Folk, that is one of the most convincing arguments that Jesus died on Friday and not, as some people say, on Wednesday. Okay, next one, sweetie. Let's take a look at the second and third plagues. It's in Revelation 16, 3 to 7. If you want to read it out of your Bible, you can. I'm going to read it off the slide. It looks like a dog has eaten some of my page over here. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. How's that go? What goes around comes around. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. They shed the blood of saints and of prophets, condemned those who sought to walk with God. God gives them blood to drink. I heard another 
out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Do people die during these plagues, folks? Do some of the wicked die during these plagues? Yeah. Does that mean that God kills? Does God break his commandment, thou shalt not kill? No. What it means is, is that God executes judgment. And the execution of a sentence, carrying out a sentence, does not mean that God killed them. It simply means that he executes the choice that a person has made. It's a big difference. Big difference. Next slide. Just like in Egypt, Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. He lifted up the rod, smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, why did God plague the Nile River? And why will God plague the rivers and seas of this earth? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 265 says, Moses and Aaron were directed to visit the riverside next morning where the king was accustomed to repair, the overflowing of the Nile being the source of food and wealth for all Egypt. The river was worshipped as a god, and the monarch came thither daily to pay his devotions. In honoring the beast in his image, in turning away from the creator of heaven and earth, are not the people of this earth today doing exactly what Pharaoh did? They're claiming all the gifts from the creator, but refuse to honor the creator. And that is why God will plague the rivers of this world and the lakes and the bodies of water because he as the creator has been rejected. Here the two brothers again repeated the message to him. Then they stretched out the rod and smote upon the water. The sacred stream ran blood. The fish died. The river became offensive to the smell. The water in the houses, the supply preserved in cisterns, was likewise changed to blood. Next slide, sweetie. Waters to blood. Notice this statement from Conflict in Courage, page 90. It says, His wonderful works and their deliverance from bondage and His dealings with them and their travels through the wilderness were not for their benefit alone. These were to be an object lesson to the surrounding nations. The Lord revealed Himself as a God above all human authority and greatness. The signs and wonders he wrought in behalf of his people showed his power over nature and over the greatest of those who worshipped nature. God went through the proud land of Egypt as he will go through the earth in the last days. Folk, all the things that, that people worship as God today, they will be smashed they will be smashed. And those who worship them will be smashed. But those who are faithful to God and seek to follow Him, God is going to work wonders. You know, I don't know, and, and I don't mean to embarrass anyone. No, I'm not going to say anything. With fire and tempest, earthquake and death, the great I Am redeemed His people. He took them out of the land of bondage. So as God went through Egypt in the days of Pharaoh, He will go through this earth in these last days. And the presidents and kings and these pompous people in the Federal Reserve and, and all of these arrogant people... Folk, they are going to know that there is a God in heaven. They're going to know it. Go ahead, sweetie. Next slide. Number four plague. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. It says, The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. 
Men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. By keeping the day of the sun, people are worshiping the sun. They have rejected the creator and because of their rejection of the creator, and their worship of the sun, the sun will turn and will scorch men with fire. Next slide. The fifth plague, under the fifth plague, the beast gets it. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. His kingdom was full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. You know, it's interesting, folk, in the fourth and fifth plagues, this word is repeated. The people that suffer the seven last plagues refuse, refuse to repent. And repentance is sorrow for sin and turning away from it. That's what Steps to Christ says. So those who suffer of the Plagues refuse to repent. What's that? Like Pharaoh. Like Pharaoh, like Eddie. Like Pharaoh. God help us to be daily in a spirit of repentance. Daily. Next slide. This is probably the plague with the most information that needs a little deciphering. Talks about the drying up of the river Euphrates. Sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up. We need to analyze that for a moment. Also this, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Who are those kings that come from the east? I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. We need to analyze that. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Folk, look at this. They are the spirits of devils working miracles. Remember that health message and give glory to Him? If we're not following, what's going to happen when miracles are done right in our sight? What are we going to do? We're going to give in to that. We're going to say, that's got to be the work of God. They're doing things I've never seen before. They're going to call fire, Revelation 13 says. They will call fire down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's a miracle. Have you ever seen that happen? Only time it's ever happened in the history of this planet was when Elijah did it. It was a miracle. We're going to see it, folks. That's why our heads have got to be clear. We've got to be getting our rest, eating right, exercising. Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Does that mean He's going to come secretly? Is He going to come with a secret rapture? Okay, we've got to analyze that. What does that mean when it says He's coming as a thief? Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What's that talking about? About putting on a garment. That's important. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. What's that? What's Armageddon? We'll analyze that briefly too. That's Revelation 16, 13 to 16. Next slide. Drying up of the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates that ran through the land of Iraq. Obviously, this is serving as an object lesson for the end of time. What happened physically in the days of Cyrus and Belshazzar from Daniel chapter 5, when Cyrus diverted the waters of the Euphrates so his men could go underneath the gates and into the city, served as an object lesson and a spiritual lesson for us. When Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon in the days of Daniel, 
the Persian army diverted the waters of the Euphrates, drying up the river. The troops took the city by marching in on the dry riverbed after the priests betrayed the city by opening the iron gates that spanned the river. This established a historical precedent. And so Revelation 16 speaks of the overthrow of modern mystery Babylon in the same terms. Now who is modern mystery Babylon? Rome. That's right. It's Rome. It's the papacy in the same terms. It is symbolic this time. Mystery Babylon is symbolic, of course. But one must look at the original historic event as a pattern for the overthrow of modern Babylon. The river Euphrates was the lifeblood of Babylon. It was Babylon's fruitfulness. Modern Babylon is no longer a mere city nor even a regional empire. It is now a global system, the system of the papacy. So the river Euphrates was the life source of ancient Babylon. What is the life source for the papacy today? What is it? Reggie, what do you say? Nations, people, giving their power to Rome? Okay. Okay. Sunday churches give their power to the beast? Okay. The drying up of the river Euphrates paves the way for the kings of the east to bring deliverance to Babylon the Great. Correct? That's what Revelation 16 said. Let's see. Let's read it again. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So when the life source of Babylon the Great is dried up, that prepares the way for the kings of the east to bring deliverance. So who are the kings of the east? Who are they? Leaders of the world, Nelly? Okay. The kings of the east, they bring deliverance to Babylon the Great. Let's see. I'll, I'll tell you what I believe it is. You go back and study and see if it makes sense to you. Next slide, sweetie. The kings of the east come. I believe there's two kings of the east. Christ comes from the east. I believe he's one of the kings. And as the river Euphrates dries up, it prepares the way for Christ to deliver his people. Okay, Cyrus delivered God's people out of ancient Babylon. He was a type of Christ. Christ comes out of the east. Matthew 24, 27 says that as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 27 that's Matthew 24, 27. Great Controversy 640 says, Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. So as Cyrus was sent to deliver God's people, so Christ will be sent. He will be one of the kings of the east comes to deliver his children. Who do you think the other king might be? That's a good guess, Dennis. I, it's right about where I am too on, on my understanding of the kings of the east. Who will also come before Christ does? An imposter. An imposter, an impersonator. That's right. And Larry, you said the devil. Next slide, sweetie. That's who I believe it is, folks. I believe the other king, it said the kings of the east. I believe Christ is the king. 
But there will be one who will come and say, I have come to deliver my people. And it will be the devil. Great Controversy, page 624 says, you say, but wait a minute, Bill, why do you have this picture of Christ in his high priestly garments? Why do you have a picture of Christ and you're talking here about the devil? Let me read the statement to you. As the crowning act, the crowning act, the final act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. Now notice what Ellen White says. Resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation, Revelation 1, 13 to 15. This is the picture. No, Christ won't be, Dennis, you're right. But see, the devil will be. Will be. He will be wearing the same garments that Christ was wearing in Revelation chapter 1. That's what Ellen White says. Revelation 1, 13 to 15. And this is the depiction. The high priest in his daily ministry, just like the one that Sheila has made over here. This is the picture. This is the garment, the, the look that the devil will have when he personates Christ. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything mortal eyes have Yet beheld, the shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hand and pronounces blessing upon them. This is the false king from the east that claims he has come to deliver his people when the devil personates Christ. I believe that the devil personates Christ, then shortly after that, Christ comes. They are the kings of the East. That's what I believe. Next slide, sweetie. The un three unclean spirits, like frogs, a frog's tongue is attached in front. It flicks out at great speed, curls around the prey, then flicks back into the mouth with the doomed dinner. From Maranatha, page 190, it says, By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. You know, folk, this one statement right here gives us such insight because when the leaders of our nation, and it could be very, very soon, when the leaders of our nation urge a Sunday law, do you know what they're going to say the Sunday law is going to do? It's going to bring us temporal prosperity. It's going to restore our economy. It's going to restore America. It's going to be the best thing for our country. It will bring peace to the world. That's right, Nellie. It's going on fast. It's going on already. Remember, some of our hospitals are so jealous with these other places. Definitely, Barbara. Folk, when leaders in our country start pushing for a Sunday law or for the exaltation of Sunday, they are bringing America will, where she will be totally disconnected from righteousness. Totally disconnected from God. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, there's your three unclean spirits, Right there. Protestantism, the papacy, 
the Roman power and spiritualism. There's your three unclean spirits right there. Here's your false prophet. Here's your beast. And here's the dragon right here. Our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. We may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former... A little too quick for me, sweetie. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Next slide. And there's our frogs, the three unclean spirits like frogs. It says one came out of the mouth of the beast, which is the papacy, one out of the mouth of the false prophet, which is apostate Protestantism, and one out of the mouth of the dragon, which is spiritualism. The devil and his masterpiece of deception is in spiritualism. These three powers unite together to deceive the world into accepting a false rest day. Miracles will be wrought to back up the false claims. Next slide. Summary. During the time of this sixth plague, with everything in shambles, the devil will impersonate Christ. By this time, the threefold powers of the papacy, spiritualism, and apostate Protestants will have reached the ultimate in deception. They have been working all along to reach this point and pave the way for the devil. Christ pronounces a blessing on those clothed in his righteousness. Next slide. Christ's righteousness. Heavenly places, page 51. Well may our hearts tune to our Redeemer with the most perfect trust when we think of what he's done for us, even when we were still sinners. Through faith we may rest in his love. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. It would be a terrible thing to stand before God clothed in sinful garments, with his eye reading every secret of our lives. But through the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice, we may stand before God pure, and spotless. Our sins atone for and pardon. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. The redeemed sinner clothed in the robes of Christ's righteousness may stand in the presence of a sin hating God, made perfect by the merits of the Savior. Only through faith in Christ's name can the sinner be saved. Faith in Christ is not the work of nature, but the work of God on human minds, wrought in the very soul by the Holy Spirit, who reveals Christ as Christ revealed the Father. With its justifying, sanctifying power, it is above what men call science. It is the science of eternal realities. Human science is often deceptive and misleading, but this heavenly science never misleads. It's so simple a child may understand it, and yet the most learned men cannot explain it. It's the inexplainable and immeasurable beyond all human expression. What inexpressible love has the Savior manifest toward the children of men? Not only does he take off the brand of sin, but he cleanses and purifies the soul, clothing it in the robe of his own righteousness, which is without spot woven in the loom of heaven. He not only lifts the curse from the sinner, but brings him into oneness with himself, reflecting upon him the bright beams of his righteousness. 
He is welcomed by the heavenly universe, accepted in the beloved Son of God. What glory can fallen man through repentance and faith bring back to God? Heavenly places, page 51. Only through faith in Christ's name can the sinner be saved. Next slide. Armageddon. Armageddon, the hill or city of Megiddo. I got most of this from the Strong's Concordance. In Revelation 16, 16, the scene of the struggle of good and evil is suggested by that battle plain of Esdralion, which was famous for two victories of Barak over the Canaanites and of Gideon over the Midianites, and for two great disasters, the deaths of Saul and Josiah. In Revelation, a place of great slaughter, the scene of a terrible retribution upon the wicked. The RSV translates the name as Harmageddon, the hill of Megiddo. Now this is, okay, so Har means the hill, mountain, hill country, or mount. Megiddo or Megiddo, the place of crowds. It was the ancient city of Canaan assigned to Manasseh, located on the southern rim of the plain of Esdralion, six miles from Mount Carmel and 11 miles from Nazareth. Another part of the word means to penetrate, cut, attack, or invade. To penetrate, cut into, to cut oneself, to gather in troops or crowds. Next slide. Now this is what Megiddo looks like today. It's a beautiful valley. Many battles, obviously the one between Barak and the Canaanites and Gideon and the Midianites took place in this valley area of Megiddo. On this map, I hope you can see, here's the Mediterranean Sea, here is Jerusalem, here is Megiddo, here is Nazareth, here is the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee right here. So Megiddo is in the northern part of Israel, but it was here that many battles between God's people and the devil and his children fought right here. Next slide. The final battle. Armageddon will be the culmination of a battle that has raged for 6,000 years between the children of God and the children of the devil. Those who have arrayed themselves under the papacy of prostate Protestantism and spiritualism will oppose those who are clothed in the garments of Prince Emmanuel. The devil will lead his forces of deception and then Christ will come to end their party and take his children home to their heavenly paradise. So folk, Armageddon, it's in process today. We think it's just some battle that takes place in one particular location. No, it doesn't. It's something that's been raging for 6,000 years. The Armageddon and under the sixth plague is just, that's the culmination. That's the final, absolute end of the battle in the sixth plague. And it's going to be against the children of God versus the children of the devil. And the children of the devil are made up of those who are worshiping in the papacy, apostate Protestantism and spiritualism versus the children of God clothed in the garments of Prince Emmanuel. All right, next slide, sweetie. Christ comes secretly. Revelation 16, 15 said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. 2 Peter 3, 10 said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now that doesn't sound too secret to me, does it to you? That's not secretive, is it, folks? In the which the heavens pass away with a great noise. I don't think a thief would do that, would he? No. And everything's on fire? That's not a secret. 
Thieves don't come secretly with a great noise and with everything burning up. It doesn't work that way. However, they do come when people least expect them to come. That they do. Christ coming as a thief means when people least expect it, He will appear. It doesn't mean He will come secretly or quietly. Next slide. The seventh plague, Revelation 16, 17 to 21. The seventh angel poured out his vial in the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. There were voices, thunders, lightnings. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. The spirit of prophecy and great controversy, we'll read it momentarily. It says that when God declares it is done, His voice rumbles through His creation and it creates a great earthquake. That's what causes this great earthquake. The great city was divided to three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give under the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. The Spirit of God, in great controversy, says that these events right here are talking about the second coming of Christ. The seventh plague, notice this statement. The seventh plague is the second coming of Christ. It is at midnight that God manifests His power for the deliverance of His people. The sun appears shining in its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. Okay, so it's talking about God delivering His people. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory. Which, whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters saying, It is done. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's Revelation 16, 17. That's the seventh plague right there. That voice shakes the heavens and the earth. There's a mighty earthquake. Now the Spirit of God quotes Revelation 16, 17, and 18, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So we're talking here about the second coming. There's an earthquake that precedes it. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory from the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind. Ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There's a roar as of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There's heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundation seems to be giving away. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. Well, this is a comment on the seventh plague. The mountains are gone. The islands are fleeing away. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Great hailstones, everyone about the weight of a talent, are doing their work of destruction. The proudest cities of the earth are laid low, the lordly palaces upon which the world's great men have lavished their wealth in order to glorify themselves are crumbling to ruin before their eyes. Prison walls are rent asunder. God's people have been held in bondage for their faith are set free. Graves are opened. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12, 2. That's the special resurrection, isn't it? Special resurrection, folk. All those who died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace 
with those who have kept his law. Great Controversy 636, 637. Praise God. I want to close. Next slide, sweet. I think that's the last one. Yeah. Folk, as the mountains are falling away, the islands are disappearing, and the earth is, is collapsing beneath the feet of the redeemed, where are their eyes? They're looking up at Christ, aren't they? Do they know what's going on around them? Do they? I think they would. <laughs> I think they, they would realize that the earth is giving way. But their eyes are on Christ, right? I think there's an object lesson in that for us today. Folk, we need to know what's going on around us, okay? But in knowing and understanding what's taking place, our eyes have got to be on Christ. They've got to be there. So, as we begin, as we continue with this year, and who knows what it's going to bring, let's keep our eyes on Christ. Let's kneel together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the spirit of prophecy today that points out the beautiful stars that are in your word. We just pray that you would give us each and every day the spirit of repentance, to sorrow for sin, to sorrow for our nature that we have. And then we pray for your power to turn away, to rise above temptation, to be victorious, to be overcomers, to be clothed in your righteousness. Bless each one of us to that end and help us to help as many others as possible to be in that same experience. In Jesus' name, amen.